Chapter Eleven, Part A, of A B C of Vegetable Gardening by Eben Eugene Rexford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven, Part A. Leftovers. There are more ways than one to secure fertilizers and fine soil for the small garden. If sward is cut from the roadside, chopped into small pieces, and stored away in some corner of the yard that is convenient to get at, and the soap suds from wash day are poured over it each week, it will in a short time, if stirred frequently, become a most excellent substitute for leaf mold. The grass roots, when decayed, will become a vegetable fertilizer which will be found extremely valuable in the culture of such plants as require a light, rich soil, especially when small. Some quite artistic effects can be secured in the vegetable garden by the exercise of a little thought. The large-leafed beet has foliage of a dark, rich crimson, quite as ornamental as that of many plants used by gardeners to produce the tropical effects, which many persons admire. When planted in the background, with fine foliaged plants like carrot or parsley in front of it, the effect will be extremely pleasing because of the contrast of color, and also of habit. The red pepper, planted where it can show its brilliantly colored fruit against the green of some plant, will give a bit of brightness that will not fail to be appreciated by those who have a keen eye for color harmony. It is well to plan for these touches of the artistic, even in the vegetable garden. Tomatoes are often grown on racks and trellises. Where this is done there will be no danger of the fruits decaying, as is often the case when the plants are given no support and their branches come in contact with the ground. It is a good idea to scatter clean, dry straw under the plants after they begin to set fruit. It is also a good plan to pinch off the ends of some of the tomato vines after the first liberal setting of fruit. This throws the strength of the plant into the development of the fruit that has set, instead of into the production of new branches which are not needed. It also hastens the maturity of it. If the tomato is allowed to do so, it will keep on growing and blooming and setting fruit throughout the entire season and as a natural consequence much of it will be immature when frost comes. It is well to prevent this wasting of the plant's forces by shortening the main branches of it in August and September. In the chapter devoted to the mention of the best varieties of vegetables to plant, I neglected to say a good word for sage and summer savory, both of which the housewife will find very useful in seasoning soups, sausage, and other articles of food. If cut when in their prime and hung in the shade to dry, all their flavor will be retained. When perfectly dry, rub the leaves from the stalks, pulverize them well, and store in paper bags to prevent the loss of their flavor. Dill and caraway seed are often used in cookery, and, as variety is the spice of life, it may be well for the housewife to grow a few plants of each. The writer has a very vivid recollection of grandmother's caraway cookies, and many of the present generation declare a liking for pickles flavored with dill. To add to the attractive appearance of the table in winter, I would advise growing a few plants of the red or purple cabbage to work up in slaws and salads. Beets are capable of giving a bit of color to the table that will be as pleasing to the eye as the taste of this vegetable is delightful to the palate. A root of parsley, potted in fall, will not only afford much material for the garnishing of the various dishes to which the housewife likes to add a touch of this kind, but it can be made the basis of a really beautiful table decoration. A few bright flowers thrust in among its crinkly foliage will be quite as effective as many more pretentious decorative schemes. The amateur gardener may begin work with the belief that one crop in a season is all he can expect from his garden. He will soon discover his mistake. The early radishes and the first crop of lettuce will mature before midsummer, and the ground they occupied can be planted to later varieties from which a fully developed second crop can be expected. Or other vegetables like beets and onions can be planted where they grew, to furnish material for the pickling season. After the early potatoes have been dug, the ground they occupied should not be allowed to lie idle. Something can be planted there for fall use to make the garden the greatest possible source of profit. Not a foot of it should be suffered to go to waste at any time during the growing season. Radishes would be well worth growing for their beauty alone. A plate of them, nested in their own green foliage, gives the breakfast table a touch of bright color that adds the charm of beauty to the food with which it is associated. The writer believes in making the table as attractive in appearance as the food on it is toothsome whenever it is possible to do so. 
I notice that I have overlooked the pumpkin. The oversight was unintentional, and I beg the pardon of the vegetable without which the housewife would be lost along about Thanksgiving time. The pumpkin is out of place in the small garden because of its rampant growth, but a few plants of the New England pie variety should be grown wherever there is room for it, to supply material for the delicious pumpkin pies most of us enjoy so much in winter. Well-ripened specimens keep well when stored in cool, dry cellars, if placed on racks or shelves that will prevent them from coming in contact with the cold, damp cellar bottom. If frost nips the tomato vines before their fruit is fully ripened, pull them up and hang them against a wall where the sun can get at them. Hang blankets over them if the nights are cold. Here they will ripen as perfectly as on the vines in the garden, and one can enjoy fresh fruit from them until the coming of very cold weather. Before cold weather sets in, go over the garden, be it large or small, and gather up every bit of rubbish that can be found. Pull up the dead plants and burn them. Store racks and trellises under cover for use in other season. If these are properly taken care of, they will last for several years, but if left exposed to the storms of winter, they will be short-lived. Dig a quantity of parsnips and salsify to be stored in the cellar for winter use. Cover the strawberry bed with leaves or straw, spreading lightly. Coarse litter from the barnyard is often used for this purpose, but it is objectionable because of its containing so many weed seeds. Many experienced gardeners advocate plowing or spading the garden in fall. This, they claim, helps to kill the larvae, which insects have deposited in the soil and it puts the ground in good working condition earlier in spring, but it will have to be gone over in spring to incorporate with it whatever fertilizer is made use of. Fresh barnyard manure should never be used. It ought to lie for at least a season before applying it to the vegetable garden. Give it a chance to ferment, and kill many of the seeds that are in it. If the soil of the garden contains considerable clay, and is rather stiff in consequence, the application of coarse sand, old mortar, and coal ashes will lighten and greatly improve it. Do not allow grass or weeds to grow on any of the unused soil in or about the garden, for insects will congregate there and make it the base from which to make their raids upon the plants you set out to grow. We are often advised to apply a dressing of salt to the asparagus bed. I have never been able to see that the plants received any direct benefit from it. But if it is scattered quite thickly over the ground, it will prevent weeds from growing, thus benefiting the plants indirectly. Asparagus is often attacked by a sporadic growth which causes the foliage to look rusty, hence the term asparagus rust. As soon as it is discovered, cut the tops and burn them. If allowed to remain, the plants will likely be attacked next season, as the spores are not killed by cold. If the bugs and beetles that attack young plants of cucumber, squash, and melon do not yield promptly to the application of dry road dust, fine coal ashes, or land plaster, it may be well to cover frames with fine wire netting, such as door and window screens are made from, and put over the plants. Care should be taken to see that these frames fit the ground snugly or have earth banked up about them, to prevent the enemy from crawling under. After the plants have made their third or fourth leaves, the beetle will not be likely to injure them. I am often asked why writers on gardening matters never advise the use of homegrown seed. One answer to this query is this. In the ordinary garden plants stand close to one another, and the varieties we grow are almost sure to mix by one variety being pollinized by another. The seed from these plants will seldom produce plants like either parent variety. Sometimes they may be equal to them in most respects, but we cannot depend on their being so. Therefore, if we desire to grow superior varieties that are pure blood, it becomes necessary for us to procure fresh seed each season from dealers who take pains to see that there shall be no mixing among their plants. Every season some enterprising seedsman comes out with an announcement that he has developed or discovered a remarkable new variety of some standard vegetable, so far superior to any other variety on the market that, as soon as its merits become fully known, it will drive all competitors out of the field. Of course this new candidate for favor is offered at a fancy price because the supply is limited and the demand for it is increasing to such an extent that the entire stock will soon be sold out. Order at once to avoid disappointment. 
Don't be in a hurry to take this advice. Wait until next season. The chances are that you will hear nothing more about it. We have so many very excellent varieties now that there is no reason why we should ask for anything better. If the novelty is the possessor of real merit you will be sure to hear about it later, but it is hardly likely to prove an improvement on what we already have, for it is hard to imagine anything superior to the standard varieties of vegetables that we have at present. I would not advise purchasing seed at the general store. Some of this may be reliable, but so much of it is inferior that one cannot afford to run the risk of experimenting with it. It is the part of wisdom to purchase where you can feel sure of getting just the variety you want. We are likely to have a few frosty nights along about the middle of September. Tender vegetables may be injured if not protected, but if covered with blankets or papers the danger may be tided over and during the long period of pleasant weather that generally follows, these early frosts we can get as much pleasure out of the garden as it afforded during the early fall. It pays to protect. The housewife will take a great deal of delight in the preparation of piccalilli, chow-chow, and the various other condiments which have such a stimulating effect on the appetite in early spring, when that tired feeling is likely to make a good deal of the food that is placed before us unattractive. In the making of these good things, unripe tomatoes and peppers will play an important part. So will onions that are too small to store away for winter use. She will find use for all these things which a man would consider worthless. Really, there is but little chance for waste of garden productions if there is an appreciative and prudent woman in the kitchen. A few roots of horseradish should find a place in all gardens, preferably in some out-of-the-way corner where it can be allowed to spread without interfering with other plants. Spread it well, every little piece of root that is broken off in the ground, in digging the large roots becoming an independent plant as soon as thrown upon its own resources. Because of this tendency to take possession of the land, many persons who have undertaken its culture refuse to give it a place in their gardens. But it is really an easy matter to keep it within the limits assigned it by promptly uprooting any plant that may make its appearance outside the space given over to it. Those who are fond of something pungent and peppery to eat with meats, either hot or cold, will not consent to be without it. It is at its best as soon as the frost is out of the ground sufficiently to admit of its being dug. It should be used as soon as possible after digging, as it loses much of its piquant quality if left exposed to the air for a short time. Roots can be dug in late fall for winter use, and packed in boxes of soil, which should be stored in the cellar or some other place where they can be kept as cool as possible, without actually freezing. But in order to have it in perfection, roots freshly dug in spring must be depended on. Leaves of horseradish make excellent greens if used when green and tender. A few of them cooked with young beets will give the latter a flavor that will make their sweetness all the more appreciable. Speaking of greens reminds me to say that the dandelion can be cultivated to advantage in the home garden. Under cultivation it improves in size and becomes a plant quite unlike the tiny hundred-leaved specimens we dig from the roadside in spring, of which a bushel will be required in order to secure a good mess for a greens-loving family, as most of such a picking will have to be discarded when it is looked over preparatory to cooking. In order to prevent the garden-grown dandelion from becoming a nuisance, it must not be allowed to bloom and develop seed. A most delightful salad can be made from the new growth of the dandelion in spring if properly bleached. This can be done by covering the plants with dry leaves as soon as they begin to grow, thus excluding light and inducing rapid development. Or, if most convenient, flower pots can be inverted over the plants. The small amount of light that comes to them through the drainage hole in the bottom of the pot will materially assist in hastening the growth of the leaves, in such a manner as to give them a crisp tenderness, and deprive them of that bitter tang which characterizes the foliage when fully grown under exposure to the light and air. Just enough of this spicy quality to make the salad delightfully appetizing will be found in them when grown in this way. Mention has several times been made in the preceding pages of Bordeaux mixture. This is a preparation used by small fruit growers everywhere to combat diseases of a fungus character which prevail to an alarming extent in almost all sections of the country in early spring. It is a standard remedy for many of the ills that this class of plants is heir to, and no up-to-date orchardist would think for a moment of neglecting its use, 
if he would grow a fine crop of apples. It has not heretofore come into common use among those who grow small fruit on a small scale, because it is rather difficult to prepare it properly. But now a preparation of it that is ready for use by simply mixing it with water can be obtained from all seedsmen. The use of it in spring when fruit is setting, to prevent injury from the curculio and other enemies of small fruits, is to be encouraged. Every gardener should be provided with pruning shears with which to prune whatever plants he or she may grow that require frequent attention of that kind. A jackknife answers the purpose very well in the hands of a man, but up to the present time no woman is known to have made a success of its use. Current bushes grow readily from cuttings. Insert a piece of half-ripened wood five or six inches long into the ground, and it will almost invariably take root. In order to keep this plant in healthy bearing condition, it should be pruned rather severely each season, cut away all weak wood, and encourage the production of strong new shoots from which fruit will be borne next season. Remove a good share of the old branches after they have ripened the present season's crop. If this is not done, the bush will, after a little, become crowded with branches, and as all branches, old and new, will attempt to bear, you will be pretty sure to have a production of very inferior fruit, since it will be impossible for the bush to perfect all the berries that set and have them come up to the standard of superiority that should govern the grower. Small currants are good as far as they go, but the trouble is, they don't go far enough. Many of them will have to be discarded when the housewife makes her selection. If the amateur gardener desires to give some of his vegetables an early start, I would advise him to try what may be called the sod method, in preference to any other. Sod is cut from roadside or pasture in fall, and stacked up in the cellar for use in early spring. When seed is to be sown, invert the piece of sod and scatter the seed over the surface, which, it will be understood, was not the surface originally. In other words, what was the surface is now the bottom of the piece which receives the seed. When it comes time to put the seedlings out of doors, the sod can be cut apart in such a manner that each has its bit of soil, and this can be transferred to the garden without interfering in any way with roots of the young plant. While barnyard manure, especially that which contains a good deal of cow manure, is one of the very best of all fertilizers, it is not always obtainable, and this makes it necessary to resort to some kind of commercial fertilizer. If one is not familiar with any of these fertilizers, he ought not to select at random, as he may get a kind not at all adapted to his requirements. I would advise finding someone who understands the peculiarity of the soil in his locality, and who has had some experience in the use of commercial fertilizers, and being governed by his advice. Experimental knowledge is often expensive, and the use of a fertilizer that is not adapted to the soil in one's garden often ruins a season's crops. The ideal support for pea vines is brush, but not every gardener is able to obtain it. Some persons substitute binder twine stretched from stake to stake. This answers very well as long as the weather remains dry, but as soon as a rainstorm comes along, the twine absorbs so much moisture that it relaxes its tension and sags in such a manner as to endanger the vines which have taken hold of it. Coarse meshed wire netting can be found much more satisfactory as it will not sag and cannot be blown down by winds. Care must be taken to see that it is coarse meshed, as the fine meshed sorts will not admit of the vines working its way out and in among the meshes. If a supply of brush can be obtained, use it by all means, and at the end of the pea season pull it up and store it away in a dry place. If this is done it can be made to do duty for several seasons. If netting is used, do not allow it to remain out of doors in winter. By untacking it from the stakes which are set for its support, and rolling it up carefully, and storing it away from the storms of winter, it can be made to last a lifetime. Don't depend upon home-grown seed. Some of it may be just as good as that which can be bought from reliable seedsmen, but the probabilities are that it is not, because of the tendencies of most plants to mix. Plants grown from seed saved from the home garden often, and generally, show some of the characteristics of several varieties of the same family, and frequently these characteristics are not the ones we would like to perpetuate. Seedlings from varieties pollinized by other varieties show a decided inclination to revert to original types, and these are in most instances the very characteristics we would like to get away from. It is always advisable to procure fresh seed each season 
and to procure it from men who make seed growing a specialty. End of chapter 11, part A. Chapter 11, Part B of ABC of Vegetable Gardening by Eben Eugene Rexford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11, Part B Leftovers. The housewife who likes to make her table and the food she places upon it as attractive as possible will do well to pot a few plants of parsley in early fall. Choose for this purpose the smaller plants. Three or four can be put into one pot if the latter is of good size. These can be kept in the kitchen window, where they will be quite as ornamental as most house plants, or they can be kept in the cellar window if frost is prevented from getting to them. From them one can always obtain material for the decoration of roasts and other dishes which require garnishment. Squashes and pumpkins will not keep well if stored in very warm places. A room that is just a little above the frost point is the best place for them. It will be found far superior to a cellar, as the latter is generally more or less damp, and dampness is one of the worst enemies of these vegetables. A cool, dry atmosphere is what they need, and if it can be given them, they can be kept in a fine condition through the entire winter. Care should be taken, in gathering them, to not break their stems. If this is done, they frequently decay at the place where stem and vegetable unite, and this condition spreads rapidly to all portions of them. The question is frequently asked, would you advise plowing or spading the garden in fall? If it could have but one season's attention I would advise giving it in spring. But if the owner of a garden has ample time to devote to it, I would advise plowing or spading in both seasons. Turning up the soil in fall exposes to the elements that portion of it which is most likely to contain worms and insects which is burrowed away for the winter, and it is desirable to make way with as many of these as possible. Stirring the soil in spring will do them very little harm, as the weather will be in their favor. Fall stirring of the soil is also conducive to a greater degree of mellowness than is likely to result from one operation, and that in spring, as the clods of earth that are thrown up disintegrate under the influence of frost and will be in a condition to pulverize easily when spring comes. The average gardener doesn't seem to associate the growing of vegetables with an idea of beauty, but he will find, if he looks into the matter, that the vegetable garden can be made really ornamental. A row of carrots with its feathery green foliage is quite as attractive as many of our decorative plants, and beets with crimson foliage are really tropical in their rich coloring. Parsley and lettuce make excellent and ornamental edgings for beds containing other vegetables. Tomatoes trained to upright trellises, are quite as showy as many kinds of flowers, when their fruit begins to ripen. Peppers work in charmingly with the color scheme of the vegetable garden. A little study of garden possibilities will soon convince one that it is an easy matter to make the vegetable garden as attractive, so far as color is concerned, as the flower garden is. And while we are at work at gardening, why not make it as attractive as possible? The pleasing appearance of it will lend additional qualities to the fine flavor of its vegetables, if we believe that beauty and practicality ought to work in harmony with each other. Sage, summer savory, and other garden-grown plants used for seasoning or medicinal purposes should be gathered when in their prime. If one waits until late in the season before cutting them, much of their virtue will have been expended in the ripening process which all plants undergo after they complete their growth. Cut them close to the ground, and tie them in loose bunches, and hang them in a shady place until their moisture has evaporated. Then put them in paper bags and hang away in a storeroom or closet for the winter. Plants treated in this way will retain nearly all their original flavor, and be found far superior to the kinds you buy at the store. Cucumbers that have grown to full size should be gathered if not wanted for use, as to allow them to remain on the vines after reaching maturity, and while ripening, materially affects the productiveness of the plants. Endive is the basis of one of our best and most wholesome fall and winter salads. When nearly full grown, it must be bleached, like celery. Gather the leaves together and tie them in such a manner as to exclude the light. 
Do this when they are perfectly dry. If wet or damp, they are likely to rot. Some gardeners use what is called onion sets instead of seed. These sets are the result of sowing seed very thickly in spring, the season before they are wanted for planting. As soon as their tops die off in summer, as they will if seed was sown thickly enough, store in a dry and airy place, and the following spring replant. By this method large onions are obtained very early in the season. Most market gardeners depend on sets instead of seed. Mention has been made of a few of our pot and medicinal plants. Here is a larger list for those who are interested in plants of this kind. Balm, sweet basil, caraway, catnip, chamomile, coriander, dill, pennyroyal, peppermint, saffron, tansy, and wormwood. Our grandmothers had unlimited faith in the medicinal qualities of some of these plants, and many a mother will be glad to know that she has a stock of some of them stored away for winter use when colds and coughs are prevalent among children or grown people. Some of the old home remedies are far preferable to those we are accustomed to using, as they are harmless if they do no good, which is something that cannot be said of most drugs that are taken into the system. Don't wait for the current worm to show itself on your bushes. You can safely count on its coming. Act on the defensive in advance by spraying your plants thoroughly with an infusion of nicoticide, keeping in mind the fact that it is easier to prevent an insect from establishing itself on your plants than it is to get rid of it when it is secured a foothold there. In spraying, be sure that the infusion gets to all parts of the bush. Throw it up well among the branches. Simply spraying it over the plant isn't what is needed. It must reach the underside of the foliage, and all parts where insects and other enemies might hide away and escape contact with the infusion used. When the small fruit plants in your garden show evidence of having outlived their usefulness, don't try to renew them, but dig them up and plant new ones. You cannot make a satisfactory plant out of one that has begun to show age. It is a good plan to set a few new plants each season. If this is done there need be no gap in the fruit supply, as there will always be some coming on to take the places of those whose days of usefulness are over. Too often we neglect our gardens until they are in such a debilitated condition that we get but slight returns from them, and then we set to work to make them all over. By planting something each season we keep them up to bearing point and have no off-seasons. I wonder how many housewives who may read this little book have ever dried sweet corn for winter use. Not many, I think. But if they were to do so one season, I am quite confident that thereafter they would not willingly be without a generous supply of it, for it will be found far more delicious than the ordinary canned article. In drying it, some cook it for a few minutes, and then cut it from the cob and spread it out on plates to dry. Others do not think it worth while to cook it, but cut it from the cob as soon as gathered and dry it by first putting it in the oven for a few minutes before exposing it to the sun to dry. The little time in the oven is equivalent to the partial cooking spoken of. Turn it on the plates on which it is spread every day, and do not consider it dry enough to store away until it appears to have parted with all its moisture. Then put it into paper bags or glass jars, and set away in a cool dark place to remain until you desire to use it. Soak for two or three hours before putting it on the stove to cook. When properly cooked, it will be tender and have a more delicious flavor than canned corn. The generous use of butter and cream will make it a dish that is fit to set before a king. Those who happen to live in places where it is not possible to have cellars because of low ground can have places in which to store vegetables for winter use that are really preferable to the ordinary cellar by constructing what might be called above-ground pits, for want of a better name. Build up a wall four or five feet high and bank up about it with so much earth that frost cannot penetrate it. Cover with a roof that will keep out cold and rain. Have a doorway opening into it from an entry built after the fashion of the little storm vestibules we put over the front doors of our dwellings in winter. In other words, an entry into which we can step and close one door behind us before we open the one that lets us into the place where our vegetables are. Such a room can be constructed with but little expense. Because of its being above ground, it will be drier than a cellar, and in the majority of cases it will be more convenient to get at. It should be boarded up with a good quality of matched boarding, and its walls should be lined with two or three thicknesses of sheathing paper put on in such a manner as to show no cracks or openings. 
The best place for a vegetable garden is where the soil is naturally well drained and where there is a slope to the south. Such a slope enables it to get the full benefit of sunshine, and sunshine, it will be found, is an important factor in successful gardening. If such an exposure is out of the question, aim to make conditions as favorable as possible. A closely boarded fence on the north side of a garden affords excellent protection from cold winds early in the season, and helps greatly in keeping away frost in fall, when many plants are maturing. Mention is made in the paragraph above of good drainage. This is quite important. If the soil of a garden is not well drained, many kinds of vegetables cannot be grown in it, and few will attain to even a partial degree of success. Therefore see to it that by ditching, or the use of tile, all surplus water is properly disposed of. Much good can be done to a heavy soil by adding to it sharp, coarse sand, old mortar, anything that will have a tendency to counteract the heaviness resulting from undue retention of water or a naturally too close character of soil. If sand is obtainable, and your garden is one in which clay predominates, use it in generous quantities. You will find it as beneficial as manure. Spread it over the surface before plowing or spading, and work it in thoroughly. A few seasons' application will bring about a very marked change for the better in any garden whose soil cannot be made fine and mellow without the addition of some disintegrating matter. Good drainage must be secured in order to grow good vegetables, and the use of tile will be found a most effective remedy for the evil of a soil unduly retentive of moisture. In almost all localities there will be families who have no garden, but who would make liberal use of vegetables if they were easily procurable. There is a chance for boys and girls to earn an honest penny if it is found that there is likely to be more in the home garden than the family can make use of. Canvass the neighborhood for customers for the probable surplus. It will be found an easy matter to dispose of it. I know several amateur child gardeners who secure enough in this way to pay for all the seed they need. Some of them have regular customers each season, and gardening begins to look to them like a profitable occupation. I don't know that they will become professional gardeners, but they will be learning something as well as earning something while they are fitting themselves for whatever occupation in life they may decide on, and what they learn in the garden will be of benefit in after life in more ways than one. Don't neglect to save everything that can be made use of for fertilizing purposes. In many a home the suds of washing day are disposed of as worthless. If applied to growing things in the garden they will often prove as beneficial as the application of a fertilizer that costs quite a little sum of money. Especially is this the case if the season happens to be a dry one. If there does not seem to be a need of more moisture in the soil on wash day, save the soapy water against a time of need. It will be sure to come handy during the season. Some families are so unfortunate as to have no cellar. Few vegetables can be kept well, or for a great length of time, in ordinary rooms, unless something is done to modify the conditions usually existing there. If a large box is filled with dry sand, potatoes, parsnips, salsify, beets, and carrots can be buried in it and made to retain their freshness for an indefinite period. Of course this storage box should be kept as far as possible from artificial heat and no dampness should be allowed to come in contact with it, as sand absorbs moisture almost as readily as a sponge, and the satisfactory keeping of the vegetables named depends upon dryness more than anything else. The lower the temperature of the place in which the vegetables are stored, the better, provided it never gets below the freezing point. Where boxes of sand are used, slight freezings are not likely to seriously injure vegetables, as the sand extracts the frost so gradually that but little harm is done. But hard freezing must be guarded against, or premature decay will result. It is an excellent plan to bury some of the vegetables named above in a dry place in the garden for use in spring. They will be found as fresh and crisp as when put into the ground, if covered deep enough to protect them from frost. End of chapter 11, Part B